Welcome to A Kind Life. Today, I'm really grateful to have Rhiannon here. How are you going, Rhi? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me. My absolute pleasure. I'm really glad that we connected. I've been following you a little bit for a little while online now and really excited that you've started something quite new, which I'm sure we'll get into in a little while. So (laughs) tell us a little bit about yourself, Rhiannon. Um, So I've been um, an animal rights activist for about four years. Um, That includes like sanctuary work, um, not just rescuing, but also like learning the ins and outs of like caring for animals all around. Um, After I got my degree, my bachelor's in speech communication, I continued my education at the Gentle Barn Sanctuary, learning um, through their summer course about like community fundraising, rescue rehabilitation, like hands-on care. And I've continued to be mentored for um, about 10 months since then with Ellie and Jay. So I've got to learn a lot from them. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I was really excited to actually read that about you. You know, I I guess because I'm from Australia, um, it's not something that I'm kind of aware of that there is a program like that available at a sanctuary where you can be mentored. What sort of inspired you to go down that path? Um, Well, when I first went vegan, I didn't know any other vegans. Like I I was very, very lost. I didn't really know what I was doing. And uh, I went to my first vigil through Ellie Animal Save. And that's where I started meeting people. And then I discovered like this whole world, like there's so many ways you can help, including sanctuary work. I discovered the gentle barn. I read Ellie's book. I watched her TED talk. I saw that they've been doing this incredible thing for like, I think now 22 years. And um, just the impact that they have, not only on the animals, but like using the animals to help people heal. Because like, you know, there's a reason we don't have like emotional support humans, but we go to animals, whether people are healing from terrible accidents or they've been like paralyzed or they have like mental stuff going on that they really just need someone to sit and listen. Animals are perfect for that. Um, She does so many programs, like just healing the community too with those animals. It's amazing to see that and I got to volunteer there like three years ago like before we were friends and got close and I had my opportunity to be mentored by her and so it's just something like I can't tear myself away from like I want to be there all the time and then I was like manifesting it's like I want to learn all of this stuff and I don't know how to get closer to it and then out of nowhere um you know I graduated had the time all of a sudden and she dropped a course that was going to be for everything that I wanted to learn. Like, you know, they'd been doing it for 20 something years and they're like, we want more people doing this work. And they dropped a course and they only accepted like a a handful of people into it. And and it was like one-on-one Zooms and then later in person more. And it was like the most amazing thing ever. I learned so much, like everything I wanted to know, every little detail. Um, Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty incredible that they offer that. And like you said, it's something that, you know, we do need more people to get involved in because sometimes sanctuaries are the kind of places that, you know, we all think like we'd love to be involved in, but we don't know where to start or how to sort yeah. of get get ourselves down that path. So that's really incredible. Yeah, I they're going to do more of it is what they, they said they plan on doing. So I hope so. Um, yeah, and I mean, down to the details of like buying property and how to go about it and like how to build fencing and what kind of materials to use and like what sicknesses animals can get and what causes it and how to cure it and how to just do like basic care that just everything they learned from experience from 20 years. And it's amazing that they're able to do that because so many people doing that work get way too busy. They have, you know, compassion fatigue and they get like they barely have time for themselves and they do it in such a way that they also take care of themselves. Like there was a whole section during that course about compassion fatigue and how to have like a spiritual self-care toolbox and like a community of people to reach out to because they do have those days where like they shut down and they're like, you know, they've admitted to me, like, it's really hard to keep doing this work sometimes, but then, you know, you fix it, you get going, you have your support and then you're like, oh, this is amazing. This is what I meant to do. And um, yeah. Is your ultimate goal, you know, yourself to run a sanctuary one day? Yes. Like if I, if I had the funds for it, I would have one right now. Yeah. <laughs> and do you have any favorite, I guess it's hard to say favorite animals because we love them all, but is there anyone that I suppose you're sort of more connected to at the sanctuary? Uh, it changes all the time. Like 
for a long time, the turkeys there like wouldn't come near me and now like they'll go and cuddle me. And so I'm like, oh, turkeys are my favorite, but it, it'll change all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's so beautiful. I as well um, volunteer at a sanctuary and it is so beautiful to spend that time, you know, one-on-one with them that especially I think too, you know, if you historically haven't had a lot to do with animals, it's beautiful to be able to connect with them and understand, you know, their own personalities and how they interact with each other in flocks and things. It's so beautiful. It's completely different up in person too. Like I remember going to a chicken vigil for the first time and I thought like, it sounds bad, but I thought that was the animal that I cared about the least. And I ended up leaving there and having like a 10 hour complete breakdown. Like I couldn't even stand up when I was like, I thought I was permanently just like in this like state of not being okay. And and I was like, oh my gosh, like once, once you're up close and, and you have those experiences, you're like, oh, every single animal is like their own individual. They're so amazing. They're so intelligent and they're just worth everything. Like they're worth getting up out of bed every morning, you know, and doing that and making time for that every day. And so tell us about your vegan journey. Like, how did you, I suppose, first learn about it? I'm guessing you were raised just like in a standard American diet um my whole mom's side is Slovak most of them still live there and so all everything there is just like meat and cheese I mean they do have healthy stuff like they have their own gardens but all the dishes there like some of the dishes are just plain cheese 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 and so I grew up on like a very heavy dairy diet and funny enough I always felt scared if I saw meat on a plate because in my head I was like oh that that used to be somebody and like we have the same cells, they have the same organs. Like I just, I felt scared. And so I didn't really eat much meat. Um, But then one day I was scrolling through Instagram and this model named Amina Blue, she had posted stuff about the dairy industry and the egg industry. And that just stuff I never knew. I just never knew what happened in those industries. And after I saw those posts, I was like, oh, okay, like I need to, to do this. And it just took over everything. Like changed my major I had to get out of the healthcare field like I didn't want to be in class and lab where they're like dissecting animals and I'm going into big pharma and everything's tested on animals and not to mention like those subjects are really hard for me too but um, then I went into speech communication to learn how to be a better voice for the animals and um, everything kind of went from there and during that journey when I was switching over um, I was having just a really hard time like mental breakdowns every day and I got connected with um, Zandra Wagner at my university, University of Laverne, and um, they're like, you should go talk to her. She's amazing. She's, you know, has experience in what you're dealing with, like feeling, you know, just so much from your heart for, for what's going on and not being able to do anything about it. And it turns out she's been vegan since the 80s and she was a student on campus. And she's like, oh, well, we still don't have a vegan or animal rights club on campus. And she's like, telling me how like they used to have an animal rights course and they got rid of that and it's just been really hard to push for things like that and she's like you should start a club and so I did and it was called students for ethical evolution and um they did we did exactly the same thing that I'm doing now and right when I switched and I started doing that stuff um I was walking out to dump my trash and like neatly stacked on top of the dumpster was like this book called um, how to run a nonprofit corporation and it had like all the forms to incorporate in the state of California and then the club at school I was using the university's nonprofit tax ID number so everything was built in a nonprofit way like how I had to get the food and you know like set up the venue and all of that stuff and get people to come and advertise everything was done in a nonprofit way so I got all of that experience and I graduated and then I stopped doing that stuff and I got really depressed and I was like, okay, I need to just do this. Like, I don't, I don't know how it's going to make me money. I don't know if I can even like sustain this, but I'm just going to try and here we are. So now I have higher consciousness events, which is the nonprofit that promotes, you know, everything from animal rights to like saving the climate to um, even like human, human justice and um yeah, just everything I care about and how deeply it's all connected and health as well. Like it's, it's making me really happy. <laughs> yeah. I was so excited to see, cause you recently launched higher consciousness events in you it was probably in the last six months. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's so cool to yeah. see. Yeah. It's so cool to see, you know, I suppose, especially being over here in Australia, we're used to the kind of 
I put inverted commas standard types of activism, you know, things like vigils and, you know, protests and like cubes of truth. But it's really great to see someone kind of, I, I feel like you're pioneering that, you know, experience where people can come along both vegans and non-vegans. And I suppose make that, you know, connection to what's important, whether it be like animals, environment, or the health aspects of veganism. And then I'm feeling like, you know, you would get people that then kind of form those relationships and connections and continue to develop that. Yes, it's been amazing because like if you're vegan and you come to the event, you kind of get your purpose reignited and you you can kind of get like re-straightened out on your facts and you're more, um, I guess, in tune with your purpose after it. Like it's very inspiring to go through that experience again to watch those films and then if you're not vegan you know being in that environment you're able to awaken to all these things that matter and if you didn't before have a purpose and your life is just kind of floating around like mine was before I found veganism then you get to have that and you're like oh there's like a huge difference that I can make as just one person and there's all of these things to care about and the amazing thing too is bringing people together like the people that come they might be in film they might be in conservation they might be in healthcare but from all those aspects like watching these films that cover you know healthcare diet um animal rights human rights like they can take that back and do things with that and be inspired to like make their own ways with it and it just like keeps going and going and that's something that I struggled with like realizing okay you know I don't have the funds to do a sanctuary work especially in the state of California like it's just such a big thing to tackle but if I sit there and I think about it I'm like okay you know, a good sanctuary could rescue like 200 animals a year. And that makes a huge difference. And every single animal is so important. But if one person goes vegan for a year, you can save about 200 to 300 animals a year. So then I try to, in my head, count it as like, okay, this person left and they're being vegan and they're being vegan. And um, the the stats are crazy too, because it's not just animals that you save. It's um, like the individual impact of every single person is way more insane than anyone could think than I thought it would ever be so like for for one day um per day a vegan person saves 1100 gallons of water 40 pounds of grain 30 square feet of forest and 20 pounds co2 and then 200 to 300 animal lives per year and then per year those numbers would be um with other stats 401,500 gallons of water 14,600 pounds of grain, 10,950 square feet of forest, and 7,300 pounds of CO2 per year. So that's one person. So then when you calculate it out to like say 100 people who attend the events throughout the year, it's just, I'm like, okay, I can be happy with that. I don't have a sanctuary, but that's important. (laughs) Yeah, it's incredible. You know, I suppose, like, did you come up with the idea from having started this club uh, during university, you sort of thought that that's something you want to, yeah, continue in your, you know, I suppose, post uni life and really make something of as a future, as a way of, you know, finding that purpose yourself and helping spread the message? Um, I didn't think about it. I was like, nope, from here, I'm going to sanctuary. Like, this is just a little stepping stone. But but now doing it, I'm, I feel like it's important and I feel like it's a stepping stone and it's teaching me to do fundraising and it's teaching me to do all the nonprofit paperwork, which is like so overwhelming, like way more than it needs to be. And all these other like little things and networking and like building relationships with businesses and people. And there's so much that I would not have been ready for in sanctuary work that you need experientially first. So I'm hoping this will be a stepping stone to that and that I can still do both once it's time, but yeah and so tell us about your first event that you held for people who may not have seen what what you guys do um so the first event we screened unity and we had food from all lock restaurant downtown la and it was delicious they have like a little private screening room in the back and like just by chance like i met um one of the filmmakers of this at a baby shower a couple weeks prior like right before like a week before i incorporated and he was like oh you should show this film like nobody knows about this film like he's the he helped with like earthlings and those films and nobody knows about unity and it's on the the nation earth page um i'm sure you know what that is and so no one no one's seen that including me and i was like oh my gosh people need to see this so i figured that would be the first event and yeah we had amazing food and amazing film and it wasn't just about you know our dominion of like 
the animal kingdom and how we exploit everything beneath us, but how we do that to each other and how there's roots to that. And it's like double-sided, like the way we treat each other and the way we treat animals and just the way we treat earth, like it's a huge problem. Like the, why, why do we have more slaves now than ever? Most, like a lot of them non-human, a lot of them human, but we have the highest number of slaves ever and we're supposed to be done with slavery. We have world hunger at an all time high. Why, why do we have that when we have all of this technology and we know why and we know what's going on and companies know why and they're covering it up and even environmental organizations know why and they're covering it up. Like, why is that happening? So it got into the roots of all of that and how, how small we are and how like quick we're here for. We're here for this little blip and we spend it like fighting and killing and doing all these things. So it just shed light on all of that. And it was very like existential as well. It's a beautiful film. Mm. and so since then you've had a second event and you're planning your third is that right yeah so the second one we screened cowspiracy which is what's called the sustainability secret so it just covered it was it was a good one it like wasn't graphic it was like a good friendly one to get a lot of people to so we had a better turnout at that one and um, it was at this beautiful private location in Santa Monica like private theater it's very comfy um, Naughty Vegan Panda donated food. We had like sushi bowls and um, rice bowls and we had wine and beer and it was perfect. <laughs> and then um, they're going to be giving us food for the next event on the 13th coming up. Um, we'll be screening Sea Spiracy. Um, and yeah, I'm like, we have to have sushi for that one because people don't know they can have, you know, all of the alternatives but a plant-based version. So we want to show that at the events. Like that's important that we always accompany the events with like really, really good vegan food. Cause when I went vegan, I, I didn't even know there was vegan cheese. I didn't know there was like vegan yogurt, vegan sushi, like all these things that everyone loves. So Yeah. And you often have like people speaking or sharing their stories at the event, don't you? Yeah. So at the end we have a discussion so people can express like their understanding or misunderstanding or just ask for more resources. If it's the first time like hearing about it, it can be like really overwhelming. Like, where do I start? So then it's nice to have like a mix. Like I'll invite a few of my vegan activist friends there and they help lead a discussion. And yeah. Yeah. It's so incredible. It's such a fantastic idea. And as you know, I'm quite jealous that we don't do that here in Australia. So (laughs) I'm hoping that someone comes up with something similar here. Yeah. I'm trying to think of ways to get it so that there can be volunteers for this. And then like, like people that want to host events that can use like our tax ID number and like do things a certain way, but I don't know how to facilitate that yet. And then I really, really want to get these into schools because like things aren't going to change unless young people change it. And I think like people that are going to change it are the ones that are going to be affected by it. Like they're going to be the ones that care the most. So I want to get them into schools. I want to get them into colleges. I've tried to reach out to University of Laverne, the Dean of Students, haven't heard back from my school, funny enough, but I'll make it happen. (laughs) And that's something I was going to ask, you know, what are some of the kind of long-term plans or hopes you have for higher consciousness events? Yeah, just getting them into schools, getting them to as many people as possible. I would like to host like really big events and like bigger theaters and be able to invite a lot of people. I have a very small email list at the moment. And um, I know that starting small is a good thing because it gets overwhelming when you're starting something new. But yeah, I want to host very big events. Yeah. I think if everyone, you know, the, the kind of films that you sit down and you watch them and you're like, if everyone saw this, it would change the world. And so if enough people see it and they tell somebody and they tell somebody else, that's that's the goal yeah yeah I actually had wondered whether you'd considered you know doing I know it wouldn't be quite the same but whether you'd considered um involving like an online aspect where people could still like sort of join in and screen like screen the film online and hear the discussion at the end but obviously it's a bit difficult not being present in the room I thought about that too and I thought about how hard it is to get people there just by enticing them with food and drinks but that's, it's not a bad idea. Everything's online now because, you know, COVID kind of made us that way, but um, I'm a little technology challenged, so I need to figure out how to make that happen. (laughs) 
it's all right we'll watch this space it's yeah really exciting and I'll be sure to um you know link all the your website and the Instagram page and things on in the show notes so that people can check it out and hopefully you know some of our US community will want to get involved and either you know come along or help out advertise it for you as well I'm sure help you know spreading it through the vegan networks and and wider network is is how you're getting you know new people involved yeah that would be amazing thank you And so tell us about the other forms. You did mention that you've been involved in vigils. So I'm guessing once you went vegan, you know, you sort of decided that you wanted to get active for animals. So tell us about that journey. Yeah. So I didn't know any vegans and I, you know, followed LA Animal Save on Instagram and I just week after week kind of chickened out from going. And one day I finally went and like one of the first people I met, I became lifelong friends with and just the whole community there. I was just like, Oh my God, this is what it feels like to meet people with the same heart. And just, it it was like, it's a very, very sad experience, but at the same time, like it kept me going back for not just for the animals, but for the community and to just experience that, you know, everyday life we go around seeing just consume, 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 exploit, and it it wears you down. But when you're around people that you're looking at them and you see them caring for something, even something so big that we're up against, it's, it's amazing. So that has kept me sane in, in that work. Yeah. And so have you, I'm guessing, you know, over time you've sort of explored different types of activism and you've just sort of found what you find is, you know, works best for you and is, is what you find to be effective. Um, yeah, I just, I go with people that I really look up to and I kind of just copy what they're doing. So like Bobby Sud is someone I really look up to. He's an organizer for LA Animal Save and he does all the photography and he's there like every single vigil. He's so dedicated and it does have a huge impact because whether, you know, you're able to bring somebody there and show them what's happening, they'll never eat that again once they see that and have that experience. Even people that are like so hardcore against it, like they go there and they have an experience and it changes them. And being able to share it on social media as well, like that's that's what did it for me. So I can only imagine like how many lives that changes and like gives people purpose and um, just awakens them to things that are important, things that are that urgently need our attention and our help. And then Um, you know, a lot of them, you you can't rescue, like the pigs are too hard to rescue and we, there's no way to get them off the trucks. Cows, not a chance. And the chicken vigils though, they're easier to rescue. And so I started doing that with Bobby as well, but it's, it's tricky because sanctuaries already, they need a lot of help and funding and you need to be able to have a sanctuary that says, yes, we'll take them. You can't just like go dump animals at a sanctuary and be like, here you go. So we always make sure that a sanctuary is willing to take them first. Um, But yeah, there's that. And then there's volunteering and outreach. But I think it all starts with people. Like if people aren't willing to change their diets, like we're going to just be fixing the problem on this side of things. And how do you manage, you know, I guess being at a vigil is quite difficult. It it is an experience, you know, like you said, you like to be there for the animals and to document it and, you know, be there for their sort of last moments, but it would take quite a toll on you as well as an activist. So how do you, you know, manage and process that? It's a good question. I think you just have to let yourself feel what you're feeling. Like if I, you know, my first few times at vigils, I was not doing too well. I was very, very emotional, but realizing like, how sensitive I am and how I'm affected. If someone in front of me is breaking down, I get more scared. So realizing that then going to the animals, like, okay, I can show up and I can be calm and I want to project this image of them. For example, to the chickens, I'll project this image of them flying free high above their cages. Like I'll, you know, just sit there and be with them and pet them if they let me and rescue them if they let me. And um, yeah, you just like realize that you're there for the animals and you take yourself out of out of yourself and just be there for them and kind of go on robot mode being what they need for that moment and realize that's why you're there you're not there to have a breakdown you can do that when you get home and that's part of life like we can have a breakdown over you know spilling something but there's things worth breaking down over and you can do that and just get back up and keep going and know that you're doing the best that you can yeah. Yeah. It's a great way to look at it. And you did mention before about, you know, self-care and I guess having some, you know, mechanisms to be able to uh, move through some of these things. So what do you implement in your life as sort of self-care rituals? Um, 
Well, I have gotten into meditation. I used to get so frustrated. I was like, I'll never do that. Um, but it's helped a lot just being able to control my thoughts and realizing like wherever my thoughts are going, my emotions are following them. And so, you know, you can be in a tough situation and be like, even though I'm feeling this, I'm here doing this versus being at home asleep in my bed, turning a blind eye, which actually would feel worse to me at this point for what I know and what I've seen. So like, there's kind of like a, like an effective way, like a happiness that comes with that and like a purpose and that feels good. Yeah. Just bringing, bringing myself back to that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It's something we have to be so mindful of is that we often get, you know, quite absorbed in, in what's going on for the animals, but it is difficult if we don't maintain, I suppose, that perspective and look inward sometimes so that we can continue to do what we do. Yeah. And getting enough sleep, drinking enough water. Like if you're dealing with other difficult stuff in life it's okay to skip that vigil it's it's okay to take a rest get some sleep yeah that's how you stay strong so yeah and do you have any other advice for anyone that you know is new to activism or is struggling with some of these things as you know animal rights activists is there anything you think would be you know great to share for them just more knowledge like the more that I learn and I always think I know it all and then I learn more so just being open to, to learning more, because the more you know, the more you learn how much you can help. And that feels good. So not hitting a wall and feeling helpless, feeling like, oh, this is all I can do. There's like always more you can do, but then also minding the balance of like self-care and caring for other things. And we are having a human experience. Like it's okay to like enjoy the human life sometimes and like not feel guilty for not being somewhere or not being able to rescue all the animals and all of that like really minding your self-talk like it's okay to enjoy this because I am doing all of these other things too um it's a human experience yeah 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 that's fantastic advice and something I think we all need to remember because we can feel a little overwhelmed at times so yeah we yeah. end up beating ourselves up for not being able to fix everything and it's just not our fault yeah yeah do you happen to have a favorite quote that you'd like to share before we finish up I do. I have it here. It says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Mm. And why is that one important to you? Um, I like that it gives power to feeling small because that's true all throughout history. The things that we told others would never change did change. So, Yeah. And tell us the, how people can reach out to you, follow what you're doing online. What's the best way for that? Um, so uh, at Higher Consciousness Events is the event page, the nonprofit page. I post there more than my personal page, which is at Rhiannon's underscore avatar. And yeah, that's all I have right now. And Amazing. then there's higherconsciousnessevents.org to learn more about the organization. Well, thank you so much for sharing your personal journey and also, you know, the journey of higher consciousness events. I really look forward to seeing what's coming up for that and yeah, see what plans you have for the future. So thank you so much for joining us today, Rhiannon. Thank you so much for having me. It was my first podcast. Very exciting. I'm sure it'll be <laughs> the first awesome. of many. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. 